Welcome to the deep dive. Yeah. So you've given us quite a stack of sources here, all about um, a pretty critical shortcut in aerospace. Yeah. Designing complex gas turbines, but doing it fast. That's right. Our mission today really is to cut straight to the core, pull out the essentials on these uh, zero dimensional and one dimensional simulations they use. Yeah, it really boils down to a fundamental trade-off, doesn't it? You've got your super detailed 3D analysis, CFD, computational fluid dynamics. Right, the fancy stuff. Exactly, it gives you incredible detail, but wow, it can take days, sometimes weeks, on a supercomputer. Which is just no good for the early design phase. Precisely. When engineers need to churn through maybe thousands of different concepts, that's where 0D and 1D models come in. They give you calculations almost instantly. They're, well, they're essential for managing risk early on. Okay, let's unpack that a bit, starting with the difference between 0D and 1D. It sounds like it's all about trading that spatial detail for raw speed. You got it. Zero-dimensional, sometimes called the lumped parameter approach, basically treats each big part, like the compressor or the turbine, as just a single black box. A black box, meaning you don't care what's happening inside. Not spatially, no. You only really track what goes in the front and what comes out the back. Inlet conditions, outlet conditions, that's it. Hmm. And by ignoring all that internal spatial variation, you take these huge complex physics equations, partial differential equations, usually, and boil them down to much simpler, ordinary differential equations. ODEs. Which means faster calculations, a lot faster. A massive speed boost. You've basically swapped needing infinite points in space for just one result per component. Okay, so then 1D modeling. That's like saying, okay, I need some detail back, but not too much. Kinda, yeah. You bring back dependency on one single spatial dimension. Typically, that's along the main flow path, axially. And what does adding just that one line, that one dimension, actually buy you? What effects can you suddenly see? Well, now you can capture effects that are distributed along that path. Things like friction losses building up or heat transfer happening along the duct walls. Oh, okay. And maybe most importantly, you can start to see unsteady wave dynamics. Pressure pulses moving through the engine. Things 0D just smooths out because it assumes everything is perfectly mixed instantly. Got it. So 1D gives you a bit more insight into the actual flow physics, especially for transients and inside the ducts. Exactly. But going back to 0D, if the compressor is just this black box, how does the model have any clue how it performs? It needs some kind of like instruction manual, right? It absolutely does. And that's really the secret sauce here. Characteristic maps. Okay. These are basically detailed lookup tables based on real data or complex simulations. They relate things like airflow, shaft speed, pressure ratio, efficiency, all of the key performance metrics. So they're empirical data tables. Pretty much. Multi-variable lookup tables that effectively summarize the super complex 3D aerodynamics of that component. That's the essential input. But hang on. Here's what seems like a big catch. If you're designing a totally new engine, but you're relying on maps, maybe scaled from old engine data, mm -hmm. aren't you kind of limiting yourself? Designing yesterday's engine just faster. That is the critical constraint. That's the Achilles heel, if you like, of the fidelity. If your map data, maybe from scaling or extrapolation, isn't a really good match for the new design. Then the model has errors baked right in from the start. Exactly. It's a calculated risk. You sacrifice some absolute accuracy upfront for the speed you need to explore the design space and find a stable, workable configuration quickly. Okay, so you got these component maps. Now, the, the whole engine system has to work together, right? It needs to run stably. What needs to balance out for that to happen? Right. This is the component matching challenge. It's crucial. You basically need three things to line up perfectly across the whole engine. Where are they? First, mass flow continuity. Simple idea. The amount of air leaving one component has to be exactly the same as the amount entering the next component down the line. No leaks, no magic air appearing. Makes sense. Number two. Torque balance. The power the turbine generates has to precisely equal the power the compressor needs to run, plus any power being taken off the shaft to, say, drive a generator or a fan. Okay, flow matches, power matches. What's the third? And third is the nozzle flow balance. Basically, the conditions at the very end of the engine have to match the nozzle's physical ability to pass that amount of flow. The final exit area has to be right for the job. And you mentioned these map calculations are nonlinear. So you can't just solve it like a simple equation. No, not directly. It's an iterative process. You typically use numerical methods like the Newton-Raphson method, which is really efficient for this kind of problem. Ah, and that's why 0D is so fast. 
because the solver can find that balanced operating point super quickly. Exactly. It snaps to the solution very efficiently. That's what enables that near real-time performance. Now, this is where, for me, it gets really interesting. Modeling how the engine changes state, accelerating, decelerating, transients. You said it's a fight against inertia. It absolutely is. And there are three key types of inertia, all interacting, that create that lag you feel when you, say, push the throttle forward. Okay, what's the first big one? The most obvious one is rotor inertia. Just the sheer physical mass, the rotational inertia of all the spinning parts, the shafts, the discs, the blades. Right. Takes time to spin all that metal up. That dictates the main mechanical lag, the DNDT, the rate of change of speed. It's the heavyweight in the system, mechanically speaking. Okay, rotor inertia. What's next? Then you've got delays caused by the air, the fluid itself. We call it volume dynamics. Volume dynamics. Like the air filling up spaces? Sort of. Think about the little spaces, the plenums or cavities between the main components. When the flow changes quickly, air gets momentarily stored or compressed in these volumes. Ah, uh, like little air springs or cushions. Exactly. And that causes tiny, instantaneous pressure shifts and flow delays that you have to model if you want to predict exactly how responsive the engine will be. Critical for control systems. Makes sense. And the third type of inertia, you called it the slow one. Yeah, the slow-moving giant. Thermal inertia. Heat soaking into the metal. Precisely. Think about all that metal in the engine casings, the turbine blades. It takes a significant amount of time for these parts to heat up when the gas gets hotter or cool down when it gets cooler. Like preheating a heavy frying pan. Exactly like that. This thermal lag is much slower than the airflow changes. It can affect clearances, material stress, and overall performance for quite a while after the engine speed itself has settled. Okay, so putting it all together, mm -hmm. What's the big takeaway here? These 0D and 1D models sound like this essential bridge. They really are. They provide that crucial speed needed for the early conceptual design work, for iterating quickly, for tuning control systems, before you commit huge resources to the really expensive detailed 3D optimization. Minutes instead of weeks for a simulation run. That's the goal. And, you know, connecting this back, it really shows the power of smart simulation, of simplifying intelligently. How so? Well, think about one of the most complex, violent things that can happen in an engine. Compressor surge. That chaotic flow breakdown. Yeah. Amazingly, you can actually capture the fundamental physics of surge using these reduced order models. There's a famous one, the Greitzer Lumped Parameter Model. It boils that incredibly complex instability down to just two coupled ODEs. Wow. So even for something really chaotic, simplifying can give you deep insight. It's like finding the physics cheat code sometimes. Reducing the problem reveals the core dynamics. That's a really powerful idea. So for you listening, maybe think about this. How often in your own field, your own work, do you find that ignoring some complexity, simplifying smartly, actually unlocks a deeper understanding or a faster path forward? That's the kind of thinking these engineers have mastered.